صباح الخير بلدي صباح الخير لكل مستمعينا Welcome to Radio Baladi the first Arab Middle Eastern and American simulcast radio show Radio Baladi is broadcast every Friday morning on WNZK 690 AM from 8 until 9 Eastern Time on Good Morning Michigan with Layla Al Husseini Our call in number 248 557-3300 And now, stay tuned for the best radio talk show on Arab and American issues with your host, Layla Al Husseini <laughs> I am Atif Abdel Jawad. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Good morning. The Syrian budget for 2021 is 27% less than last year. It is also the smallest budget since the uprising in 2011. The latest contraction is nothing new. Since 2010, Syria's per capita budget spending has de declined or decreased by 70%. In other words, the government will spend three times less on its citizens in 2021 than it did in 2010. And that, despite the fact there are only about half the number of people living under its control. But that's only on the economic front. Syria faces pressure to reform according to Security Council Resolution 2254. Syria also faces Israeli strikes on Iranian and Syrian targets as the Biden administration now seeks to return to the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran. To discuss all of this, the future of Syria and other related questions, we have a group of distinguished guests and experts. Ambassador Tudor Katouf, president of Amid East and former ambassador, U.S. ambassador, uh, of course, uh, former U.S. ambassador to Syria. Professor Joshua Landis, director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma, and award-winning journalist Ray Hanania, special correspondent for the Daily Arab News. Let me start with uh, a question that I would like all uh, three guests to answer, uh, we'll start with uh, Ambassador Katouf. And the question is, what is the real threat facing the government of President Bashar al-Assad now? Well, when you say the real threat, I think the plural form of threat is uh, more apropos. Uh, the fact is that, <clears throat> Well, Assad has, to an extent, prevailed in keeping uh, in power, keeping himself in power, and those around him who who ensure his uh, uh, rule. Uh, it's come at a horrific cost to all of the Syrian people, uh, and uh, uh, as you indicated, uh, you have millions and millions of refugees living outside Syria millions more internally displaced people, uh, and the poverty uh, level is over 50%. Uh, that is 50% below what's considered the uh, poverty line. Uh, meanwhile, you have foreign actors everywhere. You have uh, Turkey uh, in parts of the uh, uh, Northwest. You have uh, Iran and Russia as allies of the Syrian regime, but neither one of them can help uh, Syria economically. In fact, they look for contracts uh, for themselves 
rather than trying to, uh, rather than being able to put money into the economy. Uh, as you indicated, Israel can hit anywhere in Syria with impunity, as can the U.S. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, Turkey and Iran are uh, uh, not getting along at all. So to me, Assad can, can hang on to what he calls useful Syria for now, but he's playing a very bad hand. And the danger goes far beyond threats to Assad. There is a danger of uh, inadvertently starting a war in that area when you have Israeli planes, Russian planes, US planes uh, flying overhead uh, and militias, Iranian, pro-Iranian militias uh, and Iranian Revolutionary Guard forces on the ground. Professor Landis. Well, I think the, you know, what we are seeing is the Lebanonization of Syria, and in, in, in fact, the entire Levant area. The economies have collapsed in Lebanon, we've seen most recently, which has really destroyed the Syrian pound, which has fallen in tandem with the Lebanese pound, and, and worsened what is already, as, as Ambassador Katouf has described, a terrible situation. So the Assad government has limited power. Most of the exit and entrance uh, ports on Syrian territory are not owned by the Assad regime anymore. They're owned by foreign com countries, Hezbollah, Iran, uh, Turkey, so forth. So Assad has very little authority. He doesn't have much authority to tax because almost 90% of the Syrian people today live under the poverty line. So the country is really broken. And this means that it has become the proxy you know, everybody's proxy armies will fight it out in Syria, as we've most recently seen. When Iraqis attacked an American base, America attacked them back in Syria. This used to be the situation in Lebanon, where everybody would use Lebanon as the punching ground. And, uh, and we're seeing that with Israel fighting Iran. We're seeing that with Turkey and <clears throat> so forth. So Assad has got minimal power. The economy has come to a standstill. There are severe sanctions and secondary sanctions, so no foreigners are, can do business in Syria with any ease because you can't send money. You know, for example, sending money to friends in Syria is almost impossible. You have to have somebody walk it across the border. So the, 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 the place has really frozen up. There's lots of violence, um, not so much war like we've been seeing in the past, but there's lots of petty violence because tons of little warlords and strong men um, are holding people hostage and stealing money. And it's very difficult, including the government uh, and government officials. Uh, a friend of mine was stuck at the border, a Syrian who had done his military service and everything. And when he was trying to leave back to Lebanon, he was held at the border. They said, you haven't done your military service, even though he had. And they wanted $300 to let him out. And he didn't have it on his person. And he was just stuck. And he was sending out text messages. What should I do? You know, the only thing to do is pay the $300. And but that, that's the insecurity that every Syrian faces today, is anybody can stop you and make these demands which you can't fulfill, and then you're, then you're in a quandary. Mr. Hanania. Good morning, Atta. Uh, first, I want to say it's an honor to be on the uh, uh, program with you and uh, Prof Professor Landis and Ambassador Katouf. Um, they're specialists in Syria. They've you know, know everything in and out. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more of my political perspective. I think Syria is in a bad spot um, because I think the uh, uh, Biden administration, every time they want to hit Iran, they're going to hit Syria. Every time something happens in Iraq and they blame it on Iranian forces, they're going to take uh, our missiles and to show and demonstrate uh, res resolution uh, and strength, they're going to target uh, Syrian targets. Um, Assad is kind of, I think, uh, caught in a quandary between that and Israel uh, wanting to also take out Iran. So honestly, I don't see a very good future. And I think the Lebanization uh, analogy that uh, uh, Professor Landis mentioned, I think is a great, uh, not a great, but a uh, accurate uh, 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 forecast of where this whole situation is headed. 
Uh, before I proceed to my next question, uh, I would like my audience to know that we are now uh, broadcasting live on, uh, on Zoom, uh, on Facebook, as well as uh, radio. Um, Ambassador Katouf, uh, one question I just received on social media is this. Resolution 2254 was approved by the Security Council, including Russia and China. So why the big powers haven't been able to implement it? Well, it's a complex question, a good question. Uh, first of all, Russia has been playing double games all along. So signing on to various uh, resolutions and accords and the like, but their goal is to become uh, more influential uh, throughout the region. And Syria is their main base uh, from which to do that. They've invested a lot in keeping Assad in power. And while they're not often not happy with his inflexibility and his willingness to make even minor gestures to uh, nonviolent opposition groups, uh, they're going to, uh, it appears they're going to continue uh, to back him unless they believe that there's somebody else who can better serve their purposes and who could somehow be installed in place of Assad without setting off an in a civil war within the regime. Uh, so I, I see Russia and then of course Iran uh, wants to be, have bases close to Hezbollah in Lebanon and Israel. They want the ability to uh, strike at Israel if uh, Israel hits them uh, through uh, bombings from uh, their Air Israeli Air Force or missiles or submarines and the like. So it's a playground as, as uh, Dr. Lanz has pointed out, Syria has become a playground somewhat like it was in the 50s, except the 50s was a more, much more peaceful time and there was a unified state, but everybody was meddling in Syria. And now uh, there's been a quantum leap, if you will, uh, in terms of the ability of outside powers to uh, do as they please within large swaths of Syria. It's interesting, um, Ambassador, that uh, even though Israel hits uh, Iranian targets inside Syria, um, uh, Syria never really, or Iran for that matter, never really struck back. And, and you just said that Iranian militias and forces uh, are close now to the Israeli border. But uh, we'll deal with that question a little later. But um, Mr. Hananiah, you know the region very well. Um, so what is the role of regional powers in first creating and then in resolving the Syrian crisis? Well, you know, in the United States, our government changes every four or eight years and policies change with them. Um, uh, initially, I think we were very aggressive. Then we were hesitant. And now I think, uh, according to... Uh, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, uh, uh, I'm not sure if we're actually going to be pushing for regime change, whether we're just going to be leveraging Syria uh, against other interests that we have in the region. Uh, I'm not sure what the plan is for Syria from the Biden administration in terms of how do we change things? Will it be regime change? I know many senators and congressmen are upset that uh, the U.S. is, uh, the Biden administration is taking actions without first consulting them. Um, so this is gonna be a big political mess before they resolve anything in Syria. I don't see much changing uh, for Syria uh, for the coming four years. And, and I do think it's just gonna get worse. When with Come back after the break. I have a question for Professor Landis. And the question is, uh, some people say that Bashar al-Assad, President Assad, is the glue that keeps Syria together, no matter what. When we come back after the break. <clears throat> uh, 
While we've been staying safe at home, scientists have been on a journey. The destination, a COVID-19 vaccine. This journey began decades ago with research into other coronaviruses. Scientists built from there with months of research and development, cooperation with other experts worldwide, and clinical trials on tens of thousands of volunteers of diverse race, age, and health status. They arrived at a safe, effective vaccine, and hundreds of thousands in Michigan have already been vaccinated. But the next step is ours. We need to get the vaccine when we can, keep wearing masks correctly and taking precautions until we reach our destination, freedom from COVID-19 and getting back to the lives we love. Discover the facts for yourself at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Ziad brand, quality products from our family to yours. Ziad Brothers Importing offers the finest quality products, including brands like Zultan, Kraft, Nestle, Hook, Rigo Picon, Donna, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad, quality products from our family to yours. At Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic in Dearborn, we provide effective physical therapy sessions in order to limit pain and discomfort. Top Rehab provides physical therapy care for any diagnosis prescribed by a physician, and we regularly see and treat conditions such as stroke, TMJ, fibromyalgia, sciatica, joint pain, and more. We use a variety of pain management methods, including modalities, soft tissue mobilization, and therapeutic exercise. If you're in need of physical rehabilitation or physical therapy, get the highest quality health care at Top Rehab. Most insurance is accepted and we're open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday 8 to 6, Tuesday and Thursday 8 to 5, and Saturday 10 till 2. Call for an appointment today at 313-846-0555. That's 313-846-0555. Choose Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic on Michigan Avenue in Dearborn. Life's too short to be in pain. I am Atif Abdel Jala. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Welcome back to our discussion on Radio Baladi. We are discussing the future of uh, Syria. We have with us uh, journalist Ray Hanania, uh, Ambassador Tudor uh, Katov, and Professor Joshua Landis. Uh, Professor Landis, is it true that Bashar al-Assad is the glue that keeps Syria together? Or what is left of Syria and why? You know, I think it, it's important to start this sort of discussion by saying that the Syrians deserve a better government than, than Bashar al-Assad offers them. Uh, on the other hand, Syrians are very divided today. And they, they, they have, and during the civil war, everybody's fears began to dominate uh, their, their future worries instead of their hopes. And, and this caused many people to look at the Syrian army and think, if the Syrian army fell, what bad things could happen? And many Syrians became frightened by that. And, and the United States became frightened by that. And I think that's the main reason why President Obama did not strike Assad's government in 2013 when chemical weapons were used by the president and, and over 2,000 Syrians were killed by those chemical weapons because they were frightened that the opposition might get their hands on. Maybe Al-Qaeda would get their hands on it. So they made the deal with Russia because they thought it was better than destroying the regime 
and possibly having a scramble for who would get those weapons. And the same thing happened again in 2015 when Russia entered in to Syria to save Assad. The United States blinked and, and Obama said, we're not going to fight Russia for Syria. And, and that was a very important moment. And I think it's because people in Washington were frightened that ISIS had already taken Palmyra it was moving around Damascus. Al Qaeda was extremely strong up in Idlib and down in the in the western parts of Syria, and they just didn't want to chance it. And uh, many Syrians didn't want to chance it. Not, of course, many Syrians did. They they thought, you know, it's better to have chaos for some time without Assad and to build anew. And and that's why we, this war went on for so long, and that's why it's been so bloody. Is Syrians were were divided over this very important issue. We have with us now on the line um, from France, uh, that's nice, uh, a Syrian journalist, Mr. Malik. He has a question or a comment, I'm not sure, but go ahead, uh, Malik, go ahead with your question or comment. Hello, Mr. Al Khir. I'm going to ask three حنبلش بالاول نحن نعلم ان الولايات المتحده الامريكيه دخلت الى سوريا تحديدا والعراق والشرق الاوسط للحد دخولها الى سوريا عفوا تحديدا لمحاربه داعش فاستطاعت في خلال الفتره الماضيه ضرب المراكز داعش الاساسيه لكن اليوم عادت داعش من جديد بشكل اقوى واعادت ترتيب اوراقها وتحديدا في الباديه السوريه وخطر داعش عاد مجددا ليشكل خطر على كل المكونات سوريا بالإضافة على القواعد الأمريكية وعلى القوى الحليفة لأمريكا ما هو موقف أمريكا وهو ما رؤية أمريكا باتجاه يخص الظهور الجديد لداعش في الشرق الأوسط اللي هو يعتبر من وجهة نظري أخطر من ظهور السابق Okay, let me translate and see who would like to respond to your question, Malik Thank you very much Malik is saying that the US intervened in Syria to fight ISIS, but ISIS is coming back. They are re-emerging in Syria and in the Middle East generally. So what plans the U.S. Um, has right now to fight back or to strike back at ISIS? Any volunteer to, to deal with that question by our guests? Well, Maybe I might say that uh, um, the response to the breakup is not to break up Syria. Uh, as uh, the professor pointed out, that uh, we kind of backed off. Uh, we didn't want to fight Russia for Syria. We don't want it as much as uh, we don't like the Assad regime. Um, Assad's response has always been, if you don't have me, you're going to have the terrorists. Uh, you'll see the breakup of Syria. Um, that fear is a huge fear um, because any breakup, Syria is so large, any breakup would create a base for any militant groups to wreak all kinds of havoc. So it's a very difficult situation. We've seen every president, uh, even Trump, he, he, although even Trump went in and launched strikes, I think in 2017 and 2018, um, because of the chemical weapons. It was more because he wanted to show he was different than Obama than it was to prevent Assad um, from uh, doing things. He just didn't want to go that far to destroy the country. So the only thing saving Assad's regime, I think, is this fear that um, if the country is broken up, it's going to be far worse. And so far, there's no other alternative between keeping Assad or seeing the country be completely destroyed and taken over by militants. Okay, thank you, Ray. Uh, that uh, takes me to a broader question. Um, ISIS, fighting ISIS uh, is one of the US objectives in Syria, but uh, Prof uh, Ambassador Katouf, uh, what are, does the US uh, really have vital national security interests in Syria, apart from ISIS. How can Washington preserve uh, its interests while the Russians are uh, present as well? 
Dr. Atif, uh, I think you're well aware that the American people are sick and tired of military, U.S. military in interventions in the region. Uh, here we are 20 years on almost in Afghanistan uh, with a deadline for this administration to decide whether it's going to pull out the final 2,500 troops or not from Afghanistan on my, May 1 uh, without any real uh, lasting, perhaps lasting change in Afghanistan after all that time. We may find the Taliban, ISIS, and others dominating the country. Uh, so, no, the United States does not have a vital interest in Syria and Lebanon, uh, per se. There are ancillary interests. Obviously, it's long been a tenet of U.S. foreign policy that Israel be a uh, secure uh, state. And to the extent that Iran or Hezbollah or others are using Syria and Lebanon to threaten Israel, that's uh, a concern they can't ignore. But a vital interest, uh, no. The U.S. is finally actually pivoting its attention to uh, the Western Pacific, China, uh, our allies there, Japan and Korea. Uh, and it's looking to uh, reduce its footprint uh, in the region. Moreover, I would also say that regime change has not worked out very well anywhere you look in the Middle East, uh, with the possible exception of Tunisia. Uh, we have civil wars going on everywhere. We have horrible humanitarian disasters, including, of course, in Yemen, uh, as well as Syria. Uh, and uh, the, within the Assad, uh, Assad, excuse me, within the Obama administration, there was always a debate going on under the service as to whether we should be backing the violent opposition uh, to Assad, because I believe that administration understood, or at least some of the administration understood, that it might lead just to chaos and ISIS becoming stronger and radical Islamist groups becoming stronger without any improvement for the Syrian people. Uh, Professor Landis, do you agree with the ambassador that the U.S. does not have vital interests in Syria? Uh, yes, I do. You know, uh, the U.S. faced a very important moment in 1947. I hate to take you back to history, but 1947, the U.S. had agreed to train and arm the Syrian army. And the... Secretary of State wrote a letter, um, Marshall, in 47 saying we can't do it. We're going to have to withdraw all our efforts because there's going to be war in Palestine and we can't be seen to be helping the Arabs. And at that moment, the Minister of Defense in Syria writes in his diaries, um, the, 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 the person, Arslan, who wanted to be Minister of Defense, he said we've got to go to the Russians because the West is not going to help us. Kowatli, the president, stopped him, frightened of Britain and others. But that, from that moment on, Syria was abandoned by the West because the West had more important interests, which was Israel and later Iraq or Turkey. But Syria never came in first. And for that reason, Syria had to go to Russia, which was number two. And it's always been marginalized and it's, it's been seen through the lens of Israel. And if you look at who America's main envoys are, like our last two envoys, James Jeffrey and, um, and Andrew Tabler, who was his assistant, they both come out of WINEP, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, which is you know widely seen as being a pro-Israeli um, uh, think tank. Why? Because the president has to look over his shoulder and, and he's working domestic politics. And, and so Syria is not the most important thing on America's radar. That's for sure. They just want, don't want it to become a major problem for them. And uh, they're constantly trying to stop Hezbollah, who they see as a major terrorist organization, hurting their major ally, and, um, and stop Iranian influence. And those are the two main interests in Syria. Stop Iran and Russia, stop Hezbollah and terrorism. When we come back after the break, we will go back to Mr. Malik, our friend from Paris, from France, and I will do the translation. 
after the break. Enjoy the first Syrian-style cuisine in Michigan. At Davos Cuisine and Catering, you'll find a wide selection of Syrian foods and sweets in our menu, like frike, hoisi, grape leaves with steak, mashawi platter, hot mahashi, char-grilled kebab, shawarma, and much more. Get super-fast delivery from Damas Cuisine and Catering right to your door. Order online at damascuisine.com forward slash menu and track your order live. Damas Cuisine and Catering, 28841 Orchard Lake Road in Farmington Hills. Call 248-987-4985. Life is a nonprofit charity that's provided humanitarian aid and development to people and communities for over 25 years, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. When disaster occurs here or around the world, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. Please help improve these efforts. Make your tax-deductible donation to Life now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. Are your hands feeling numb? Do you feel pain opening up a jar, turning a key? Are you noticing that your elbow and your shoulder are becoming stiff? Or were you recently injured in your arm? Hello, I'm Dr. Albajit Katranji, and at the Katranji Hand Center, which just recently opened down the street from the Somerset Mall, we can provide you with the latest in hand, wrist, elbow, and shoulder care. Visit us at www.katranjihandcenter.com to learn the latest techniques that we have to offer you, and I look forward to taking care of you. Visit us in Troy at 1565 West Big Beaver Road, Building F, or call Katranji Hand Center for an appointment at 248-869-4263. That's 248-869-4263. I am Atif Abdel Jawad. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Welcome back to our discussion on Radio Baladi. We are discussing the future of Syria. We will go back one more time to Malik from France. He has another question. He will read it in Arabic. I will do the translation. But Malik, please be brief in your question. Arju al ikhtizal wa ikhtisar fi su'alik. Go ahead. Tfaddal, Lil Sis Malik. Yeah, hello. Su'al al Tanin, Hnan Naris, and Iran, Shakil Khatar, Laysa ala Surya Fakat, wa Nama ala Iraq. Yani, Khatar Iran, ala Surya wa Iraq, like in Khatar Halani, out ala Surya wa Hada wa Iraq, wa Nama Afbaha Muakharan, Bishakil Mubasher, ala al Kawa, ala al Amrikiya, fi Shakil Alfad. وعلى الدول المحيطة بسوريا السؤال ما هو موقف أمريكا من هذا الخطر وهل توجد برأيك خطوات جدية من أجل الحد منه جدية وعملية وليس فقط مجرد تصريحات Thank you Malik His question is uh, uh, simple uh, Iran is a threat and not just uh, to Syria and Iraq and uh, surrounding countries but also a threat to uh, American U.S. bases in the region. So what is the U.S. doing about dealing with that threat? Ambassador Katouf. Well, it appears that the Biden administration with some of the same actors in key positions as were in the Obama administration or the Obama-Biden administration, if you like, are still see uh, preventing Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them uh, as the paramount issue uh, regarding uh, Iran. Um, they appear to believe, and here I'm, ex here I'm intuiting, I'm not sure, but uh, Iran is getting beaten up pretty badly in Syria and its allies as well uh, with Israeli, uh, airstrikes all across the country, uh, and its economy is extremely weak. Uh, and uh, so Iran is not as strong as it would appear. 
yes, they're able to project their power into Iraq, in Syria, and influence greatly the politics of uh, both countries, particularly Iraq. And they are also blocking the formation of a government in Lebanon through Hezbollah. Uh, but at the end of the day, Iran has, uh, and this Iranian regime has many weaknesses, uh, but, the, uh, but the administration of, seems to also recognize that it cannot just merely go back uh, to the uh, JCPOA as it was negotiated, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action intended to stop uh, nuclear enrichment in Iran, but that it has to try to satisfy some of the critics in the US Congress by getting a bit more. That's a, uh, that's a very heavy lift. Uh, Mr. Hanania, I received a question for you uh, on social media. The question is, do you think Syria is heading for a division, uh, an Arab-Kurdish division, and would that resolve the Syrian crisis? And I, I don't think so, but uh, uh, there is the only red line that I see now isn't uh, whether how much force Assad uses against his own people. He's, he's really more focused on... Uh, uh, you know, what the U.S. and Israel might do. But um, I really see that, uh, that the real concern, though, is that uh, they're trying to find a way to survive um, in this situation. And I think that with the U.S. reaching out to Iran, uh, opening the door to diplomacy, um, while they're negotiating this new policies and changing uh, uh, you know, opening the door to Iran to pursue diplomacy. Um, I think the Iranians, the Russians uh, are going to lean in on Assad um, not to do anything that would upset that apple cart. Um, so I see this kind of uh, moving in neutral for the next few years um, as they uh, stumble through negotiations with Iran. I don't think they're going to end up with anything good. It can't be any better than what we had under, you know, or worse when it was under o Obama and Trump. Um, I just don't see it getting better. And I'm not sure the Kurds are the biggest problem that uh, we face in uh, Syria. Uh, Professor um, Landis, uh, do you agree with Ray? In other words, do you think an agreement uh, between the U.S. and, and Iran on the nuclear issue can help resolve uh, or at least decrease the tensions in, uh, in Syria? Well, you know, let, let, me, let, let me go back to the Iran question to begin with. And, you know, America's been divided and its allies are pushing America not to let Iran out of sanctions. And that's their major concern. You know, there are a lot of hardline Israelis and Saudis who would prefer <laughs> If the United States would keep sanctions on Iran to keep it poor, if Iran moves to build a bomb and refine up to 90 percent its uranium, then they can bomb it because there are many analysts who believe that you can stop it from developing the bomb through military action and pinpoint strikes the way Israel did with Iraq and Syria's nuclear projects. But that the worst danger is to let Iran out of sanctions, because if they get wealthy, and can trade their oil and gas, they're going to have much more influence in the Middle East and they can, they can beef up traditional militaries. And so that's the concern for the allies. Now, the, the, Obama, the Obama and the Biden administrations have decided they don't want to bomb Iran and therefore they need this deal so that they don't have to go to war with another state and get distracted into this, this cycle of escalation and that they're willing to let Iran out of some of these sanctions. Now that, of course, holds dangerous because it does mean that Iran can have much more soft influence because it'll have more money. Already Iran, for example, has, has reopened and paid for the reconstruction of 13 schools in just one city like Deir ez -Zor. but it's in other cities. They are doing stuff on the ground. Of course, they don't have the money. As, as Ambassador Khatouf said, they don't have much money to do this with. But if they got more money, they would spend it 
And what Iran would like to do is build a pipeline going right across Iraq and Syria to the Mediterranean that would supply Europe with oil and gas. Now, America doesn't want that because it'll strengthen Iran. If Iran can get its oil and gas out to Europe, Europe would become more pro-Iranian, and you can see how things would go. So the United States needs to stop that trade, just the way they have their troops at Tunf, which is the main highway for trade between Baghdad and Damascus, which is halted by American troops because they don't want that communication between Iran, Iraq, and Syria and Lebanon, which helps Hezbollah potentially and so forth. But but the real importance for it for Assad is that it, it's destroying trade and it keeps everybody very poor. And uh, that's the, you know, from America's point of view, that's just collateral damage. But from, from a Syrian point of view, that's vital income that's being denied them. So, you know, what I, I guess what I'm saying is that because of this larger strategic war between Iran, the United States, Russia and the United States, the Syrian people are going to continue to suffer because nobody is thinking about the people. They're thinking about this as a battleground, as we start at the beginning, uh, where one side is going to win and they do certainly don't want the other side to win. So they're both trying to deny the other side the possibility of rebuilding and reconstruction um, in order to hurt the other side. And that's that means the Syrian people are going to probably stay poor uh, and divided for a long time. I hate to... We, so thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, now we have uh, Dr. Gazul from Jordan. Uh, she has a question and she speaks in English. Go ahead, Dr. Gazul. So I'm not... Okay. Are you still there, Dr. Gazul? Okay, uh, we can't hear Dr. Gazul. So we'll proceed with my next question until we get the connection reestablished with Jordan. Um, so Ambassador Katouf, um, President Assad uh, seems to have survived and won despite great pressure. What are the probabilities of him staying president for life? Well, if you could tell me how long he's going to live, I could probably better answer that. <laughs> but, uh, look, Assad is not in a great position, but the Assad brand has always been, I might, I might be bad, but the other guy's going to be worse. So you better stick with me. And it seems to me that that is still the Assad uh, brand, although much uh, reduced, as we discussed earlier, that one of the reasons there was hesitancy within the Obama administration to enforce its red line on chemical weapons, although it was much more complex than this, was that uh, concern to do, that they would uh, to stabilize the regime, perhaps even cause it to collapse, and uh, into that vacuum would rush some truly uh, radical elements, Islamist elements, uh, that would uh, do far more damage to uh, U.S. and Western interests uh, and uh, than uh, Assad ever could. So uh, the U.S. was to some extent ambivalent about Assad remaining in power. As far as the future goes, uh, as we as we have discussed, Syria is divided up among many actors. Uh, Turkey, I do not believe, is particularly interested in seeing Assad remain uh, president of Syria for life. Uh, Russia is always looking for an advantage. And therefore, as long as Assad's the most useful for them, uh, then they'll stick with him. Uh, the United States doesn't care enough, I don't believe, to try to do anything to replace uh, Assad. And for Iran, he's rather essential. So I don't know about for life, but I think Assad, if he avoids assassination, can remain in power for quite some time. Now, uh, Mr. Ray Hanania, um, as the ambassador indicated, and some people believe and say that President Assad may be bad, but the alternative could be worse. 
does does the U.S. take that into account? I don't think so. I think that uh, the U.S. and other uh, countries uh, are looking at uh, the politics of Syria. But, I, you know, I, as an Arab American, I've always believed that, you know, in some situations, um, you know, we really don't have democracy in any of the Arab countries. And I argue we don't have really have democracy in Israel either. Um, but the next best thing is a strong, uh, uh, you know, father figure. Uh, I grew up in a family where my father put his foot down and that was it in a, a large family where my cousins, uh, our relatives, uh, you'd see this one tough person hold everything together. And I think the Arab culture is like that, where we, where in many instances, we do need one tough hand to hold things together. And, I, and uh, unfortunately, that is, can be good and it can be bad. It was bad in Iraq, um, where we had Saddam Hussein holding everything together, but at a great cost you know, to uh, human rights. And I think that that's the situation in Syria um, where we have one tough hand trying to hold everything together um, and uh, where human rights and especially the refugee problem now is horrible. So it's, are we ever going to have an elected democracy in Syria? No, That'll, that will not happen for generations maybe. Um, so it's either going to be outside control or it's going to be some tough dictator who may be benevolent that we can hope for the best, um, or it'll be a dictator who is a tyrant, as many people see uh, Bashar al-Assad. When we come back after the break, I have a question for Professor Landis about how Syria has failed to regain the Golan Heights. Why is that after the break? Get ready for an amazing experience at Ishtar Restaurant on 15 Mile Road in Sterling Heights. Enjoy excellent hospitality from owners Ali al-Baghdadi and Fatty Bottom serving the best in Mediterranean food. Try Chef Ali al-Baghdadi's famous shawarma, the best Iraqi grills and food, and the best Arabic and international dishes. Dine in our authentic atmosphere or take out. Call 586-698-2585 or check us out on Facebook. Ishtar Restaurant practices all CD guidelines and is open every day 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Have an amazing experience today at Ishtar Restaurant 3625 15 Mile Road, Sterling Heights. Are you going to start a restaurant or grocery store soon? Do you need floor plans and designs? Call Naji Aboud at 734-744-9796. Do you want to buy kitchen and restaurant equipment at discount prices? Call Naji Aboud now, 734-744-9796. New concept products and design, the trademark of kitchen equipment. 5% discount on all purchases of $75,000 or more. New concept products and design, new location, 31185 Schoolcraft in Livonia. Learn more at www.newconceptproducts.com. Call Najee Aboud, 734-744-9796. When it comes to reproductive medicine, IVF Michigan Fertility Centers are the recognized leaders. With locations in Bloomfield Hills and five other cities in Michigan and Ohio, IVF has experts in all aspects of the field. As a founding member of IVF Michigan Fertility Centers, Dr. Nicholas Shama is one of the leading reproductive endocrinologists in Michigan and Ohio. Dr. Shama has performed over 10,000 IVF cases and has helped thousands of couples fulfill their dreams of parenthood. American board certified in both obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive endocrinology and infertility, Dr. Nicholas Shama is a very caring, compassionate, expert physician that understands not only the medical but also the emotional toil of infertility on his patients. When it's time, get personalized care from Dr. Nicholas Shama at IVF Michigan Fertility Centers in Michigan and Ohio. Call toll-free 855-952-9600, 855-952-9600. I am Atif Abdel-Jalal. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time.
I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Welcome back to our discussion on Radio Baladi. We are discussing the future of uh, Syria. And uh, my question goes now to Professor Landis. Uh, Syria has failed to regain the Golan Heights by military force. It has failed to regain it by negotiations. Can it ever regain it now that the U.S. thinks the Golan Heights are vital for the security of Israel? You know, I think the short answer is no. Um, but, you know, uh, let me tell you an anecdote. About 12 years ago, I was in a conference in, in New York, Nash, the, the Council on Foreign Relations, and a high Israeli defense official was there. And the, the, of course, we went through this Golan question. And um, the, the Defense Department guy said, you know, why do we want to give away the Golan? What are we going to get in exchange? A flag flying over an embassy in Damascus? Is that a good deal? And ultimately, that's the question that's going to weigh on Israel. Israel is so much stronger than Syria. The balance of power is so much in favor of Israel's. And uh, Assad has just gotten a lot weaker, and Syria has gotten weaker, and it's divided. Um, We've seen what happened to Jerusalem. We see what's happening to the West Bank. Uh, everything is going in the wrong direction for return of Arab land. And, uh, and I think that that, you know, unfortunately, is the future direction for some time to see. Uh, Ambassador Katov, you uh, earlier talked about Israeli strikes uh, in Syria, uh, strikes uh, against Iranian and Syrian targets. So we have seen neither country, um, neither uh, Iran nor Syria responding to the strikes. Why is that? Is that because Israel is much more powerful as uh, Professor Landis uh, indicated a minute ago? Well, it's, it's difficult to get into the minds of the Iranian leadership, but I'm not sure I agree entirely with the premise that they've done nothing. Uh, it's asymmetric warfare. So we saw a bomb go off uh, on, I believe, an Israeli cargo ship that had to be taken into the port of uh, Dubai uh, just in recent days. And the uh, many people see the fingerprints of Iran all over that. Uh, I'm trying, forgive me, I'm trying to recall maybe one of my colleagues on the uh, panel, Ken, but Iran or Hezbollah not so long ago did something in Israel that uh, Israel retaliated for. Uh, but Iran is capable of playing a long game, as we know. Uh, and uh, right now, they're, you know, they want to see if they can get the sanctions lifted on their economy by working uh, with the U.S. They probably understand that Israel would like nothing better than to draw them, uh, you know, than, excuse me, than to hit their uh, nuclear sites. Uh, uh, why else do they have all these advanced aircraft, uh, et cetera, and, and uh, smart missiles? Uh, so I think Iran is proceeding cautiously and uh, uh, is willing to take its losses in Syria for now. Uh, in the belief that better days might be ahead for them. Doctor, we, we do have uh, Dr. Ghazul with us back from Jordan. She's been waiting. Okay, Dr. Ghazul is back from Jordan. Go ahead, Dr. Ghazul. She speaks in English. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nahak Ghazul. I'm a Syrian academic at Paris Monterre. Uh, currently in Jordan, and uh, a member of the civil society that belongs to the uh, UN Special Envoy, Mr. Bederson, and also in the small committee of uh, Brazil's negotiations. 
Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, about uh, everything you are saying. But uh, as a Syrian, we feel uh, the bitterness that we have been left over um, as people. Um, I believe that, you know, during Mr. Obama's uh, presidential uh, ship, uh, he gave the green light in 2015 to the Russians to enter Syria to support the regime. As a result, they knocked the country uh, down. They knocked all the cities down. Uh, they tried all their uh, weapons. And now they support the gangs that kidnap people for ransom. And, uh, you know, uh, they offer them presents at the end. Uh, they support the drugs, especially in the southern part of Syria. And uh, they recruit youth to send them to fight in Libya and in Panama. And at the same time, Mr. Putin at that time, uh, you know, when he was given the green light to enter Syria, he promised that within four years he would be able to help the regime restore, uh, uh, restore peace and control the whole country. Uh, as you know that, you know, 40 percent of the country is out of the control of the regime after five years. Now the Syrian people are eating, literally speaking, from, uh, from trashes. Um, you know, a couple of days ago, a very famous actor was on the Syrian TV telling them that she has seen by eyes a father is selling his son, six years old. Uh, when she asked him, how could you do this? He said, I have uh, six other children. I can't even feed them, so I want to sell this one to feed the rest. Syri uh, the ministers are going on TV to say that, you know, they cannot. Uh, survive people even with the bread. So people have to bake home as if, you know, flour is available. Mm -hmm. Russians, uh, uh, Russians actually rented all the vital utilities and institutions in the country for the coming 50 years. They take the salaries of their soldiers from the price of food of Syrian people. Uh, they made the regime pay for every airstrike like 1,050 uh, thousand, uh, hundred thousand, uh, uh, dollars for every strike. And uh, needless to speak about the hundred thousands of strikes they did. At the same time, you find the Iranians are fighting with them. Whenever there is a deal with the Russians, the Iranian wants something, uh, in return. We feel that, you know, uh, uh U.S. Uh, has the power to stop all this, but they didn't. Uh, Obama and Biden and maybe Trump are selling us for the nuclear agreement with Iran. I mean, Trump is not- Ambassador, would you like to respond? Like well, I'll, 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 be, I'll be quick. I Look, uh, unfortunately, not many stories get out to the West about what's going on on the ground in Syria in terms of the suffering of the people. We can talk about you know, 90% of the people, if uh, Professor Landis is right, being, uh, and I assume he is, being below the poverty line, et cetera. But these, these stories aren't getting out. There's just too much suffering all across the area. Yemen, Libya, Iraq, wherever you look. And the United States, as I said earlier in the program, the people are sick and tired of wars in the Middle East. They feel that uh, things have gotten worse, not better, and they're not really wrong in many ways. Uh, and so the United States is not going to be sending uh, troops uh, to try to uh, uh, rid Syria of Iran or, for God's sakes, Russian uh, military uh, and start World War III. It's not going to happen. And it's a shame for the it's – a, it's a terrible – thing that so many people are suffering, so many innocent people, as the result of uh, great power politics, but, uh, and domestic misrule. Uh, uh, so that's, that's unfortunately where things are, madam, and I'm very, very sorry because I have a lot of sympathy for the people of Syria and Lebanon. Thank you very much. I have a lot more questions for my guests, but unfortunately, we are running out of time. Thank you all. I will be back the first Friday next month. Have a good weekend.
Thank you. Thank you.